Uh, Ashley and Colby Frey, you live in Fallon, Nevada. Yes. And Church I said, and, Church of and I said Nevada right. Yeah, yes. you did. Good job. I know there's a stink about that. I, I think I saw a video of Brian Williams from NBC News having to apologize during a primary or something because he, he mispronounced Nevada. He said Nevada and, and got in trouble for that. Yeah, it's funny. There's a, a meme going around uh, saying, you know, we were really slow on counting our votes in the last election. And they said, we're holding our votes until everybody pronounces Nevada right. <laughs> nice. And then when I came to visit the last time, I went to Genoa, which is another name you have to kind of learn. It took me probably a day or so before I finally stopped tripping up over that one and, and got it right, because it looks like Genoa uh -huh. and was actually named after Genoa, Italy. But there's something about Nevadans that they want to have a unique pronunciation, I think. There you go. Yeah, I don't yeah. know. We're unique like that. Yep. <laughs> so uh, I want to talk a little bit about your your farm ranch, as well as talking about the whiskey, and also build this into the story that we're talking about with with Virginia City. How far away are you guys from Virginia City? You know, we're probably about an hour drive. Um, you know, they're a little bit towards the west from where we are. Mm -hmm. Okay, and. Uh, do you, uh, is that one of the, you know, first sort of test markets for you guys when you were, I mean, cause you have a drinking culture there. It's, uh, yeah. it's built on a history of saloons. So, uh, you know, how, how did you get started when you, when you started putting out your, your whiskey, were you kind of locally distributing or did you just jump straight to a, a national distributor? So, um, we have the opportunity and we're fortunate enough to have a cute little tasting room right on our property and we're open every Saturday from noon to four. So we had a pretty significant following and built up clientele. So when we did launch our bourbon, we were able to really capture our Northern Nevada, um, I guess you could say it, like community mm -hmm. and all of our fans that have, have come out and visited us and uh, questioned us when we were going to launch our bourbon. So as soon as we did, people were, were really excited, but it, it primarily um, went to all all over northern nevada first and then we uh expanded to southern nevada and we're in 500 locations statewide currently okay. yeah and, and didn't release our bourbon until december of 2019 mm -hmm. and so um you know relatively new and we're really fortunate because when we did release it it, it i mean we sold 10 times more mm -hmm. than we thought we were going to at the you know during the release and, and had a great reception um you know in virginia city reno carson city you know all mm -hmm. of the, the areas here in northern nevada yeah. So is it, uh, was it difficult introducing a Nevada bourbon versus, uh, did, did, did you sense anybody saying, um, so what, what's all this Nevada bourbon thing about? I don't, th I don't think so. Um, I think from day one, we wanted to do things the right way, not the easy way. And so our batch one of bourbon is a blend of 180 barrels aged 4.7 to 5.3 years. So we didn't cut any corners and um, it can stand up to any straight bourbon whiskey on the market from Kentucky, um, where they've been doing it for hundreds of years. And we're really proud of that. Yeah, it's, a, it's very interesting to see these distilleries that are going into non-traditional areas. And what I find really interesting about it is how you have to deal with temperature, uh, you know, climate, and, you know, how you're going to make your changes there. And you own your own ranch where you're doing 100% of your own grain to glass. So you really have control of everything from front to back. Yep. When you started out doing whiskey, did you did you feel like you um, had enough knowledge of, of grains that it probably would be an easy transition into making whiskey? Or did, were you a little bit uh, uh, hesitant on that? No, that's a good question. We, you know, my family's been farming in Nevada since 1854, and we've always grown grains, wheat, rye, barley, and corn. Um, and, that, and that's really who we are and what we do. And so um, we actually got our license to legally start distilling. It's a federal license because there was no state laws until 2013, mm. but we got our federal experimental license in 2006. 
And that gave us, a, you know, six or seven years until 2013 to get all of our grain uh, varieties figured out. So we did lots of tests with different varieties of grain, different ways of like fertilizer and irrigation management and different, um, you know, all these different things that we can do in the field. There's a lot of things we can do in the field to create better quality for distilling purposes. And I always got to say that because, um, you know, it's almost the opposite of what we do if we were growing it for the cattle market. And so by growing it ourselves and really focusing on, on one aspect at a time, we were able to determine which varieties grew the best. Um, you know, there's little things we can do like drought stressing them at certain times and, and things like that. Certain fertilizers that we don't want to add because they might lower our starch and increase our proteins and things like that. So, um, you know, that way in 2013, when we uh, built our big uh, distillery that we're, we have now, we knew exactly how we wanted to grow it. We knew our mash bills, our types of yeast we were gonna use, the type of equipment we wanted. And we just said, we don't wanna cut any corners at that point. We wanna get the exact equipment that we want. So we actually have a continuous still and a pot still. So everything goes through two different distillation processes. Um, you know, we have all big 5,000 gallon fermenters and mash cookers and, and beer wells. And, and uh, then we always said, we're not gonna re release any whiskey if it's under four years old ever. And so we don't want to cut any corners. We're just going to wait the full time. And so um, that's why we're really fortunate. And, and, you know. Yeah. It's uh, it's interesting that Nevada took a while to get all of that passed. So you're sitting there between 2006 and 2013 and you've got a license. Does that mean that you are able to create it? You just can't sell it to anybody. Exactly. So we could make it, um, you know, we could age it, we could experiment with it, but we just couldn't let anybody else taste it and we couldn't uh, sell it. And so um, it was kind of like a, a blessing in disguise because it really gave us um, really a confidence in what we were doing when we, uh, you know, got the laws passed in 2013 and uh, we were able to produce a decent quantity. Um, we got a lot of whiskey in the pipeline now. So it's, it's really, um, you know, it was it was a big mode of confidence for me. So did you start out um, creating your own pot still and doing it kind of small scale and then ramp up? Yeah, and so um, I built our first uh, three pot stills from scratch myself, um, and we kind of played around with them and tweaked them and and changed the heads on them and the you know the cooling apparatuses and and condensers mm -hmm. and everything else, and so. Um, you know, really, uh, I love to tinker around like that. And so when we were able to go to Vendome Copper and Brass and have them make our still, we kind of knew exactly what we wanted and how we wanted it made. And, and uh, you know, that, that really gave us a head up on if we didn't do that. And you started with a pot still, but now you have a combo, don't you? You've got a hybrid uh, still? Yep. So we have a continuous still and a pot still. And um, we, we like it that way because we feel like with the pot still, we can do, uh, we can fine tune it more. We can take a generous heads cut if we want to. We can take a nice tails cut. We got, you know, you can um, you can do the things that you can't really do as easily on a continuous still, but with the continuous stills, they're so much more efficient. And so it was great because we got the efficiencies of the continuous stills and we stripped down all the mash in the continuous stills. And then we pump it to the pot still and we redistill everything one batch at a time in the pot still. And so we feel like we're getting quantity from the continuous stills, but quality from the pot stills. And so it's kind of the best of both worlds. You know, instead of putting 8% uh, mash into the pot still, we're able to put 40 or 45% alcohol that's come out of the continuous still in there and redistill it and get five or six times more volume per batch in the pot still. Okay. How did you uh, come up with your formulas, your, your mash bills? Did you come up with a, a set of like three or four different ones and kind of go between them. And then we have to talk about aging as well, because you'd have to be probably testing out uh, different lengths of time. And, and what was your process in, in doing that? Yeah, that's a great question. What we did first is we distilled every one of them on their own because we wanted to taste what they taste like without any other influence of any other grains. And so wheat, rye, barley, and corn, and we could taste it. And then we kind of decided like, we like the creaminess that the wheat gives off and the rye gives a nice little spice. And then the corn is so balanced. And then malted barley is, is um, less about flavor and more about the enzymes that it creates during the, you know, mashing in and the, the liquefying of the starches. And there's so many, you know, 
good things that barley does. And so mm-hmm. we actually, our, our mash bill is four grains. It's wheat, rye, barley, and corn. Mm. Um, you know, and obviously in bourbon, it's, it's, it's more corn than anything. Cause it's gotta be, yeah. um, our, ours is 66%. And we're really open about our mash bill and our, you know, everything that we do because we feel like nobody else could really replicate it because they, you know, they'd have to grow the grain in our soil with our varieties, with our irrigation techniques, and then, you know, have our distilling set up and, uh, you know, our types of yeast and everything else. And so we're really open with our mash bills and, and everything else. Did, did you find yourself actually changing some of your farming techniques when you started coming up with the mash bills? Absolutely. And so, um, and that's the, that's, what's really fun as a farmer is to kind of play around with different varieties of grains with different, like I said, irrigation techniques and, and different fertilizers and everything else. And we're continually experimenting every year. We might plant the 90% of a field with what we know works and 10% with a new variety or two that, that we want to just test. And what's great about it is, is if we don't like the way it turns out, if the grain's not perfect for the distillery, it's still great cattle feed and we can sell it to the, you know, there's dairies next door or, or whatever. And so we're able to, um, you know, continually learn like that. And we, mm-hmm. we tell everybody with better inputs, you end up with better outputs. And so, um, you know, by growing our own grains and growing them in a way that encourages quality. And I always say for distilling purposes, because we don't want to knock what other farmers do, you know, farmers Mm -hmm. are are all great, but for our purposes, they need to be a certain way. And so we can grow the grain better by growing it ourselves and we could just buy it on the open market. Mm. And were you already doing those four grains on your farm at that time? Yes. And so we've always grown those okay. grains and maybe not every year, all four of them, you know, but the markets go up and down. And so, you know, as a market would go up for one or the other, we would grow it. And, uh, and so my family, that's why for whiskey, it was just a natural fit for us because we've always grown grain. I've always loved whiskey and it was kind of a way for me to combine my, my love of agriculture and whiskey and, and start making whiskey. So nice. We're, we're going to take this timeline backwards, actually, and we'll yeah. work back to 1854. So yeah. you guys, when you got started on this, you, you took this over from your father, and your, your father actually had a winery that he started on, on site. So how much of that winery experience helped you in figuring out what you were going to do with a, a, a distillery where you're going to be pulling all of your grains in? from your own farm? Yeah, that's a great question. Cause we also have had a, had a vineyard here on the farm. And, um, my dad was looking for ways that consume uh, crops that consume less water. Um, you know, and you can generate income, additional income and vertically integrate. So he planted vines and, uh, we started a winery and it really made, it taught me a lot about fermentation. Um, you know, a lot about the, um, you know, the basics of everything. And we're sitting there, Um, and, and it was, it was my idea. I'd always liked whiskey better than wine. And I always thought, why are we growing wheat, rye, barley, and corn already? It's what we've grown for 165 plus years. Why aren't we making something out of those two and making whiskey, which, you know, is, is, um, you know, in my opinion is a bit better fit for us, our family and who we are. Mm -hmm. And I, in addition to um, just on the agricultural side and the fermentation side, it also allowed us to learn about how, you know, distribution works and Mm. placements in your off-premise and your on-premise accounts and, you know, really establishing that relationship with our distributor so that when we had our bourbon ready, you know, we were already existing customers of theirs. And it was a really natural transition and really easy way for us to pivot from the wine to the whiskey and, and focus on that instead. I think this is what we sometimes forget about when you're talking about starting up a distillery is the business side. There is a lot of business to know and having some of that experience, you know, coming from the winery, which was Mm -hmm. that distributed mainly within the state or did that also kind of go outside the state? It was, it was a lot smaller than any of the quantities that we put out for our bourbon. Um, but I mean, you know, it allowed us to to learn about packaging and, it, you know, mm-hmm. the glass and bottling and, you know, pickups from our distributor and sending bills, you know, everything that, you know, we talk about on the business side. Yeah. And, and I'm I'm fortunate because my grandfather told my dad, 
my dad wanted to go to school for agriculture. And my grandpa said, don't go to, for, to school for agriculture. You can't learn agriculture in a book. You kind of got to learn everywhere you go is different. If you go to the Midwest, it's different than where we are. And you go to California, wherever you go in the world, it's it, there's different soil types, there's different climates, there's different, I mean, even different markets for the crops that you're growing, you know? And so um, he said, I can teach you everything you need to know about agriculture. Go learn business in school mm. because more farms go bankrupt because of bad business practices than bad farming practices. And so my dad became a CPA. And so that was really fortunate because he taught me a lot about business. And then I went to school and got my degree in business management. And so then came back to the farm. And so I, I really think that agriculture is a lot of business. But and then it's also a lot of other things. You got to be a weatherman. You got to be a <laughs> agriculturist. You got to be a mechanic. You got to be a <laughs> um, electrician. Yeah, an electrician, a plumber. You know, you got to be a little bit of everything. And so it was great because growing up, my dad and I we, we built wagons from scratch, just out of you know big wagons. We built remodeled all kinds of tractors. Um, we built a cannon. Um, you know, all kinds of fun stuff growing up that really gave me confidence in doing things like building a distillery. And so in the distillery, uh, we did all of our own plumbing, all of our own electrical, um, you know, a lot of the, the, the main parts of the distillery. When Vendome actually built our still, they, they built it in the factory, took a few pictures, and then sent us the pictures. And we had to put it together just looking at these pictures because it's one of a kind, you know? And so um, it was really fun for us because it, it allowed us to, to understand it inside and out. But it's that, that confidence that my dad gave me by you know, building all kinds of stuff growing up to, to, to do that kind of stuff. It, it feels like whiskey and agriculture probably go hand in hand that way, that learning how to make whiskey is something that just develops over time. You, you experiment, you, I, I hear about people going to school for distilling and then coming out and becoming distillers. And I do a hundred plus distillery tours, hearing different processes everywhere, different opinions on how to make whiskey. And I think, yeah how could anybody come out of school and really handle this right off the bat? Exactly. And that's why you have to do it. And that's why we're really fortunate to have gotten our license seven years before we really started producing a, a large commercial quantity. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, as farmers, we got lots of time in the winter. And so uh, we had all kinds of experiments going on and um, we really fine tuned it and knew what we wanted. And, I'm really fortunate because a lot of people said, why don't you hire a consultant or why don't you go to school and learn, you know, learn something. And like you said, everywhere is different. And I feel like if I would have done that, I would have had, you know, more of a tunnel vision rather than being open for all kinds of different possibilities. Yeah. It's, uh, it, it's fun to see also the personalities that each of these distilleries get through all of that sort of self-diagnosis and and also where you kind of get your passion for what kind of whiskey you want to make uh you you started out with bourbon was that is that your goal is to be known for bourbon or will you jump into experimenting with other stuff oh that's that's a yeah, good question so, um, too. our flagship bourbon is about 80 percent of our production and then we do about 15% rye whiskey, which is the mash bill is actually 100% rye. So that's really exciting and a fun project for us. And then the last 5% is actually some fun innovation that Colby can kind of touch on. It's something he loves. Yeah, I always tell everybody it's 5% of our production, but it's 90% of the fun, you know? Mm -hmm. So we make um, all kinds of different whiskeys. And what's neat is we make each one individual still because I really like the flavors of 100% wheat, 100% rye, 100% barley, 100% corn. Um, but we also malt here on site. So, you know, we want to have total control over our entire process. And so to do that, we have to malt our own barley on site. And so um, by malting our own barley, that means we can also malt corn, wheat, and rye. Mm. And so um, we actually have a like 100% corn malt, which is kind of fun. It's really interesting the, the taste. We have a quad malt, which is wheat, rye, barley, and corn in the same ratios, but they're all malted as our bourbon. And uh, so that's kind of neat to taste what, you know, all the malted grains taste like next to our others. But we also made scotch style, you know, single malts. We made um, uh, smoked um, oat and rye and all kinds of just fun, wow. unique stuff. Oat whiskeys. We have five grain oat, oated bourbons. Um, we have all kinds of neat stuff that um, we haven't released yet because 
we, 80% of our, our production is bourbon. And so we wanted to release our bourbon, get a good foothold in that before we release any of our, our fun um, specialty products. And so we wanted to be a, we are, we're a bourbon distillery that makes other fun stuff. But I, don't, I didn't want to be known as a, <laughs> a distillery yeah. that makes a bourbon, you know? Yeah. It would be really interesting because you would have something that I haven't seen anywhere else. If you did this in your visitor center where you could taste an oat whiskey, you could taste a corn only whiskey, you could taste a, a malt only whiskey, a rye only whiskey, and kind of have the opportunity to taste all those side by side. Because, um, you know, I mean, I think most distillers do tend to uh, use that little bit of, of malt, uh, malted uh, barley, and that's just a technique that gets used everywhere. And it's only now that I'm starting to hear people say, oh, well, I've, you know, we have a malted rye. And so we just use the malt in the rye to be able to do our creation of our whiskey. Yeah, and that's what I always wonder, like when you get a 80% rye or a 55, whatever percent rye, you always wonder how much of the flavor is coming from these other products, you know, mm -hmm. the other, not products, but the other grains. Right. And so that's why I wanted to do 100% of each. And then also, I, this is kind of a fun project that is a couple years down the road, but um, I always thought it'd be kind of fun to do like a store blend, you know, instead of a store barrel pick, you can send them a vial of 100% wheat, 100% corn, 100% rye, mm -hmm. and they could sit there with a, a syringe or something and just get the exact ratio that they want for their store, you know, or their, their pick. Absolutely. I think uh, individuals would love to do that as well. You know, the big trend right now is to get your own little mini barrel that's charred and put whiskey in it and, you know, finish it yourself. And, um, and we have lots of moonshine around me. I live in South Carolina. I'm not far from Tennessee. And so you see these moonshine places all over the place. And I actually did stop off and buy some moonshine that were different mash bills to see if I could kind of formulate my own and then put it in a barrel and, and age it myself. Yeah. So it's very, yeah, very similar. And that's what I thought it'd be kind of fun. And a store could go in and say, they could, they could, post their their recipe or they could just say no this is our secret recipe you know <laughs> <laughs> so let's step back again uh into the the history as we're kind of stepping back towards uh how you got the ranch because the ranch was actually uh the town of genoa i believe is the first town in nevada and then that was founded in 1851 and you're, there was a Frey Ranch in Genoa in 1854. So where did yep. the where did the family come from before they, were they were they in Nevada before that or did they? Uh, uh, that yeah. was that was a Mormon settlement. So I don't know if that was uh, they came in with that settlement or they didn't come in with the Mormon settlement, but they were they were there at the same time and uh, and they originally we settled and we got our first deeded property in 1854. And so it was actually the first deeded property in Nevada. It was, um, Nevada didn't become a state until 1864. And so it was 10 years before it was considered a state. And that it was actually my great, great grandfather and seven other people. There was eight people that were deeded property at the same time for the first, you know, the first eight ranches. And mm -hmm. it's kind of neat. His ranch was in Genoa and it's still there. It's not the Frey Ranch anymore. The now they call it Ranch One because it was mm -hmm. the first ranch in Nevada. Um, and so uh, they came from the French Germany border originally. And then they, they came from back east. Um, they have quite a bit of family, I think, in Louisiana still. Um, New Orleans. Nor Nor yeah. yeah. Okay. And so. Um, we have a picture in the distillery actually of uh, my, my great grandfather and his brother. And then there's two brothers that stayed in, in, Nor uh, in Nor Louisiana yeah. and uh, they came to see each other after 50 years in the late 1890s. They hadn't seen each other for, wow. for over years and they have a picture and it went in the paper and it's kind of <laughs> neat, you know, brothers yeah. meet for 50 yeah. years. Yeah. That was the news. Yeah. Big news. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so then it's 1944 when your grandfather got the property that you're on now. So did he sell off his interest in the other and then move over? How did that work? So in the meantime, they, they moved to the Lake Ridge area of Reno, which is South Reno. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, there's a golf course and a bunch of fancy houses there now. But uh, and the right next to it was the Peckhams. That's my great grandmother is a Peckham. And the Peckhams um, owned a lot of places in around Reno. Um, I, we have a picture of my great grandmother um, and her 1899 University of Nevada Reno basketball team picture. Wow. And it, they all played in dresses. The ball didn't even look round. It was pretty I didn't wild. Think it even bounced. Yeah. It's uh <laughs> it was in the championship game by a score of two points to three points. Yeah. It was a net fighter. Yeah. Wow. And, uh, <laughs> but anyway, so the Peckhams and the Frays lived next to each other. And so my great grandmother and great grandfather met and got married. And my grand great grandmother died giving birth to my great uncle. Um or great great grandmother gave anyways. Um, and, uh, my great grandfather was heartbroken. And so he actually moved to Churchill County into the Fallon area here, mm. which, because it's known for its really high quality farm ground, we're in what they call, um, the oasis in Nevada. Um, Nevada is mostly desert. So right here in Fallon, we have a lot of an abundance of water and agriculture and farm ground. And so he moved here. And then my grandpa bought this place that we're on right now in 1944, um, at the time, it was owned by a, a senator, and he uh, it, it has a really nice big house on it. But it's really a neat story because also in our distillery tasting room, we have a picture of a dirt dugout. And he literally lived in a dirt dugout um, on another farm in town here. And he he farmed it for three years, and it was a, just a dirt hole, dirt floor, dirt everything, so that he could save up enough money to put a down payment on this place. Mm. And, and he was given some farm ground that was considered unfarmable and he was able to pull thousands of trees. He invented this tree stump puller out an old model a car and some geared down gears that he got from a mine. And he pulled thousands of trees and made this ground farmable. And then he sold it to his baby brother, the one that um, my great great grandmother died giving birth to for a dollar (laughs) and then bought this ranch that we're in right now for $60,000 in 1944, which at the time, Everybody said that he's going to go broke. That's a, you know, that's a ton of money. And today you can barely buy a truck for that, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's also interesting to think about, it seems counterintuitive to go to the high desert of Nevada to become a farmer. Yeah. So what, what are the, what are the challenges that you find you have to deal with in farming in that, that kind of, uh, it's not a terrain thing because I think you're, uh, from what I saw, there's a lot of flat land but it's it's more just that elevation and probably the soil and that sort of thing. Yeah, and I think that one of the um, things that when people were settling in Fallon and moving here, there was a, a promise of water. And we're really fortunate because we have a wonderful irrigation district and we have the water that flows from both sides of the Sierra Nevada mountains. So both sides, I guess, of Lake Tahoe in the Sierra Nevada mountains. Um, through the Carson River and the Truckee River. And then they uh, go to a man-made reservoir called Lahontan. And that's what the farmers can pull off of. Um, and so I think that without that, we wouldn't... We wouldn't be, we wouldn't be here, yeah. <laughs> that's what's really neat. And so it was the first uh, federal reclamation project um, in the state of Nevada. It was in the early, early 1900s, like 1901 or 1902. Um, some, you know, I'm not hundred percent sure, but, yeah. um, and, uh, they, they built the dam and we have all of our water is all, uh, surface irrigated flood water. So we don't use a lot of electricity. We don't pump it from the ground or anything like that. Like most of the farms around Nevada and then, and really around the country, mm-hmm. um, you know, and then we don't get a lot of rainfall though. And so it's actually a good and a, you know, a good thing in a way, because, um, we get the water on the fields when it needs it, mm-hmm. but we're not you know, we're not that feast and famine that they have in the, you know, Midwest and a lot of places, either too much water, not enough water, you know. And so we're also really dry here, not very humid, which is really good for when we're trying to grow the grains, because we don't have mold issues, we don't have fungus or mildew and all that kind of those kind of problems that you might have, if you're constantly getting either rainfall, or if you're irrigating with sprinklers or anything like that, that, you know, grain goes towards the top of the plant if it's wheat, rye, or barley, or in the middle of the plant if it's corn. And we flood irrigate everything. So it all goes on the ground underneath the grain. So it's not getting that that constant, fil- you know, water filtered or, or irrigating over it. So 
Um, we also, it's very dry here, so we don't have to use dryers or anything like that in our silos to, to dry the grain down to get it to store properly. And so we're really kind of in this unique, ideal spot yeah. to grow the, the grains um, and then also we even, we do grow some other crops like alfalfa on the ranch. The ranch is pretty big. So we got extra ground for other stuff. And what's really cool is this year, all of our alfalfa and actually the last couple of years is going to China, Dubai, Taiwan, and Japan hmm. because it's such high quality here because we are in a, a pretty decent elevation. We're at about 3,960 feet and we get really hot days and cool nights. And what that does is it allows the plants to grow during the hot days and then breed during the cool nights. Mm. And so it's really good for the plants, um, you know, the, their growing process. And uh, we grow really good corn here. We've always grown lots of corn and and, uh, and then wheat, rye, and barley. And you uh, also have dairy cattle there. Is that correct? We don't, but there's a dairy next door bordering our farm. Uh, okay. okay. All of the byproducts from the farm here get sold to the dairy next door. So all of the, the spent grain goes to the dairy. And then what's great is they make a lot of manure. Manure is the best fertilizer there is. Mm. So we take that manure, we spread it on the fields to grow the next crop. And it's this nice little circle where mm -hmm. the yeah. feed goes over to them and we get the fertilizer back. And, uh, you know, my, we're actually sitting in right now. My grandpa used to have a dairy here that my dad didn't care for dairy cows and they got rid of it in the 70s. But we're sitting in the dairy barn right now that my grandpa used to milk his cows and that he <laughs> built oh, wow. in the in the early 50s <laughs> it's not a dairy barn anymore yeah. it's a beautiful office yeah, yeah. And beautiful conference room and everything yeah. so so ashley did you have a family that had a background in farming or are you no. learning on the fly yeah learning on the fly um but in, enjoying it and um having a lot of fun i love how we have uh, vertically integrated our business and we touch every aspect of it so from growing the grains to you know milling distilling to the packaging um, and to selling it in the tasting room, being able to do that full circle is kind of what I love. And really understanding the business that way is something that um, I've taken great pride in. And I think one of my favorite things to do is when we sell a bottle in the tasting room, it's the first time any of those um, ingredients have ever left our possession. So um, I think that's uh, a point of pride for us. Yeah, and Ashley also, so we're, I'm really fortunate because um, she's also has her marketing and PR degree. And mm. so she's really good on the marketing, the PR, the packaging, you know, all that. Say, kind of it, did you have uh, something to do with this uh, not, did, yeah. beautiful, so heavy I, bottle? Yeah, I took the lead on all the packaging and everything from that uh, beautiful topper, you know, was something that was important to us. It's the shape of a bolt which is uh, we felt like something that you would you would see here on the farm. And I, I find them in cold pockets all the time when I'm doing laundry <laughs> and they're solid. Um, we did not want to go with plastic. We wanted them to be, you know, a, a nice uh, have a nice weight to it. And then as you work your way down to the label, um, you'll see that it, it's kind of like a belt that wraps around the bottle. Mm. And it's actually in the exact same shape as Colby's um, belt buckle that his grandfather gave to his dad and his dad passed down to him. So uh -huh. it you know, wraps around the whole bottle and we pulled that beautiful yellow color um, from the, sh the color of corn. So as you can see, I mean, it's, it's exactly the same color. We nice. call it fragrance yellow. Um, and also represents the beautiful sun sunrises and sunsets and the grain growing in the field. And then um, I'm not sure if you noticed, but if you tip over the bottle, you'll see that we do have what we call a hidden message on the bottom. Mm -hmm. And it says, um, be good to the land and the land will be good to you. Um, Free Ranch Estate, five generations uh, farming in Nevada, product of the USA. So, you know, the nice. be good to the land and the land will be good to you is just a Frey family motto that um, is uh, not just a motto, but a way of life here. We have to take care of our soil and take care of the farm. Um, and that's, you know, the beginning of our operation. If we don't take care of the farm, then we don't have a future, right. you know, as yeah. farmers. So I want to pass the farm to my kids on in, you know, in as good or better condition than I received it in. And I'm fortunate that my dad and my grandpa and everybody did the same thing. And so, um, that's why it's really important, um, you know, to be the found, it's the foundation of our bottle and kind of the mm -hmm. foundation of us as farmers. So I heard that you guys had a very interesting way that you met you want to tell that story? 
Oh, sure, go for it. <laughs> yeah. So I was going to college at the University of Nevada, Reno, UNR, and uh, um, Ashley was obviously too. And I lived with four other guys and Ashley lived with four other girls. And at one point, all four guys in my house were dating the four girls in her house. <laughs> so then Ashley and I started dating. And then it's it's funny because they all, you know, all of our roommates broke up over time. None of them got married or anything. And Ashley and I did. So it made our wedding kind of interesting because... Uh, They're all still know, close friends. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nice. And yeah. you're from Gardnersville? Yep. I grew up down in Gardnerville, but, um, you know, born and raised in Nevada. Okay. I was going to say the, um, I, I, I got a chance to go there, went to JT Basques. Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Got, to, yeah. got to throw a dollar bill up on the uh, ceiling. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's, that's, that, that's a really cool area in there. It's beautiful. The, um, Sierra Nevada mountains just running oh, right yeah. along there. Just, just. Do you have a pecan punch? <laughs> uh, I had a pecan punch. Yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, yeah. So when, I'm, I'm kind of edging into the conversation about the tourism side of things because we talk about, you know, you're not far from Virginia City, you're not far from Reno, you're not far from uh, Genoa and that area down there as well. And so what are you guys doing in terms of, I know COVID has probably changed some stuff, but but what are you guys doing for your tours? Do you show off the distillery? Are you showing off some of the ranch? How does that uh, tour go? Sure. So um, we're open every Saturday, noon to four. We do complimentary tours and tastings. Um, we like people to be able to experience um, our way of life here on the farm. So um, while we don't do necessarily tours of the farm ground, you see it. You're you're breathing in that beautiful country air. You, you drive, drive through. through. It to get here, yeah, yeah, you drive through the, <laughs> the field. You know, when it's 15 feet tall, just to get to the property. Um, but when you're on the tour of the distillery, you start in the still room and you can see the mash flowing through the tanks um, and the stills. And then you go in the back in the fermentation room where you can actually see that um, fermentation taking place with the uh, bubbling tanks and the um, mash cooker. And then we uh, go right next door to the barrel house where you're able to actually see the aging barrels. And um, that room smells wonderful. It's mm. typically people's favorite part. Um, because it's, you know, so beautiful with the expansive, you know, barrels and, you know, the aromas that come off of it are amazing. Yeah. I, the, the warehouse is always one of my favorite spots. So you, um, how are your, uh, how's the climate for aging whiskey in Nevada? Do you, do you have to do anything in that warehouse to control the temperature at all, or do you just let it go? And, and, and how is that affecting the aging on your bourbon? Yeah. So that's, that's a really good question because here in, in Northern Nevada at the high elevation, it gets down to zero degrees for a couple of weeks in the coldest part of the winter. And it gets up to a, over a hundred degrees for the hottest part of the summer. And that really allows that expansion and contraction. So our, our, let me, let me explain. Our barrel warehouses are unheated, unair conditioned. Okay. And we want them to get the whiskey to get hot during the hot summers and expand in the barrel and then cold during the cold winters and contract and it really helps with that aging. And so here, um, you know, they always say that four seasons is really important for the aging of whiskeys. And Ashley and I always laugh because here we have four seasons in one day sometimes, you know, and <laughs> definitely can, uh, you know, age whiskey really well here. The only negative part about our climate is there's very little humidity. Mm. And so we do have humidifiers in the barrel warehouses um, because at high humidity, you actually lose more, wa uh, high humidity, you actually, so Losing low more humidity, alcohol? Yeah, more okay. water. Yeah, yeah, at yeah. high humidity, so, um, which would make the alcohol content go up if the humidity is low. We don't want, you know, we don't want the water to come out of the barrel. So we'd actually rather lose alcohol at high humidity Therefore, we don't have to add as much water to get it down to 90 proof like the, the bottle you're, you have right there. And so then it's more concentrated. It's more flavorful. We're not having to dilute it as much with the water. And so that humidity is really important for, for a couple of reasons. Yeah. So once you get through, say, four years to five years worth of aging, where is your proof in that barrel? It, it almost stays the same. And it's, it's mm -hmm. wild because we just bought, we just dumped... Um, batch number two of bourbon. So uh, a couple of days ago, we tested the proof and it was uh, just a couple like points. Like I'm, I'm talking about like 
two percent off of where we put it in the barrel as an average and the barrels really vary from barrel to barrel but uh it's very close it probably helps you in kind of getting familiar with the taste as well that you're not having to taste it as it's getting stronger or as it's it's getting weaker you you, you have consistency there yeah yep and nice. I think that really has a lot to do with the adding the humidity to the barrel warehouse. Whereas if we didn't do that, I think the proof would go up, up a lot. I think I am probably the one podcaster on whiskey who takes the longest to actually taste the whiskey. <laughs> I just let it sit there and tease me for as long as I possibly can. That's uh, patient, yeah. So you have multiple types of, um, uh, you're, you're doing a, you do a rye and mm -hmm. you have the uh, straight bourbon, and you actually have this in a higher proof, or is this, uh, this is a 90 proof? Yep. Right, so what you're gonna taste is our 90 proof, our four grain straight bourbon whiskey, aged almost five years, or an average of five years. We have our rye whiskey, which like I mentioned is 100% rye. Mm -hmm. um, this one is aged five years, bottled in bond, so it's at 100 proof. And then we also have our single barrel product, which is the same mash bill as the 90 proof, but it's um, expressed as a single barrel um, at cash strength. So this is whatever that single barrel proof came out at, and it's not blended with any other. So each um, single barrel will have a little bit different taste. We have some that come out really caramely and butterscotch creme brulee. We have some that are earthy and spicy and woodsy mm -hmm. and some that are like fruit bombs which is amazing that they that they're able to taste so different but based on where they are in the warehouse um you know the mash bill's the same distillation techniques are same but but their aging is a little bit different where they're located in and what type of barrel we is, use so. is there a strategy that you use in choosing which ones are going to become your single barrel cast strength there yeah. you I think our strategy is that we just have to taste we them taste all. Every single <laughs> we barrel. Taste every yeah. barrel. Yeah. And, and, and we, we keep them out be, for different, like Ashley said, for different mm -hmm. reasons. They, we don't want them all to taste the same either. Yeah. And so we want to offer different store picks mm -hmm. so that they're a little bit unique. Now, none of them are off the wall, like just crazy, you know, yeah. different. But some of them, like Ashley said, are fruity or caramely mm -hmm. or maybe spicy. And yeah, we just, um, in batch two, uh, when we tasted through those, I mean, we, we don't find any bad barrels, but we do find some barrels. Um, we found two of them that have this like vanilla wafer. I mean, it's uh, wild. Really? It's, and it's like, it's nothing like the other barrels that they're around, but it's like just these two barrels. <laughs> so of course we keep them out because we're like, that's really good. Yeah, we're yeah. gonna keep it losing. That's yeah. different. I was gonna say vanilla uh, wafer would have been uh, right, up my, uh, right up my alley. Yeah. So yeah, don't throw that barrel away. Have you ever had a barrel that you've gotten to and you went, uh, no, no. This just isn't going to work. Mm -hmm. No, I, we haven't had any of those um, out of, I think we've dumped uh, several hundred barrels now. So, um, you know, but we have had several barrels that were completely empty by the time we got to them. Yeah. I don't know. They, they leak a they, little bit. Or wow. A, yeah. Yeah. That's going to be a heartbreaker. <laughs> so yeah. what's interesting is all the different uh, notes that you went through, I've experienced in some way or another with this one. Uh, I cheated and did sip a little bit ahead of time. Um, sometimes what I'll do is I'll either just go in blind and do the, the tasting right away, which scares me because I never like, you know, just approaching it when I'm under pressure and trying to come up with tasting notes. So that time of just sitting there and enjoying it. And sometimes I'll even go out and I'll read other people's tasting notes just to see if, if what I'm picking up is what they're picking up. And, and it's really interesting because uh, as, I'm, uh, uh, as, as I was reading notes, somebody had mentioned, let this whiskey sit for a little while in the glass before you drink it. And when I first tasted it, I poured it straight out and I started to drink it. And I remember walking away from it going, uh, I liked it, but, it was, uh, but there was a lot of the kind of ethanol properties to it, the, 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 the fumes of the whiskey itself were overpowering me at first and i came back to it two days later poured it in the glass after reading somebody saying that let it sit there for five minutes and i went wow this is like a different whiskey i mean I, that there, there's a hint of that in there but it's just a hint all the other stuff starts to come through and i wonder if that is because of first of all the non-chill filtering 
but maybe also because you're using uh, you know, four different grains in there, and we're used to bourbons being either rye bourbons or or wheat bourbons. I think so too, and then I think some people always notice that the neck they call that the neck pour. You know, the first one that you dump out of the bottle, yeah, is usually a little bit different than the rest of the bottle. You know, and so I always kind of try to pay attention to that and uh, don't you- take too much uh, weight on the neck pour and drink that one and then taste the next one and. Yeah, and it, it's kind of fun. But I yeah. do, I do think that you know our whiskey does open up really nicely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, the, the uh, caramel comes out to me, uh, yes. very strongly. Yes. There's what's it surrounds the glass, mm-hmm. uh, and it also surrounds the entire experience from front to back for me. It's like it never leaves you, and it actually punctuates on the end for me. It's like that kind of a toffee kind of thing almost that hits me on on the finish uh, i get the butterscotch too and a little bit of maple yeah and i i'm always i've always really liked and 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 i guess when we're coming up with our recipes and everything else what's just as important for me is the finish as the you know the actual mm. taste of the whiskey because it, it's what makes you want to keep drinking and that's what i really enjoy about this whiskey is it has a really good finish that kind of makes you want to drink more not you know, sometimes I drink a whiskey and I think I just I just want this to stop now, you know. And, <laughs> so um, what's inter- what's interesting on this one is that I can't put my finger on it. Actually, I can now at this point. A part of me wanted to say it was uh, right before you get to the finish. It has the, the rye is coming through. Yeah. But I think what's happening with the rye initially is I was kind of mixing it with kind of a baking spice thing that I was getting. But now, rather than being a cinnamony kind of thing, it's it's more of a black pepper, right? And it and it rides there, but then it just you know kind of fades off as as you go into. Now I feel like I've just been had one of those little caramel candies in my mouth, um, yeah. and it just kind of lingers on your tongue. It's really interesting. Yeah, and that's what yeah. I mean, that's what we were shooting for for that finish. You kind of want that kind of sweet lingering finish, but also. If you if you taste it, what I attribute a lot of the mouthfeel, it's got a little bit of a creaminess to the mouthfeel. Like it's got a rich, rich creaminess. And we I think that, that a lot of that comes from the wheat. Mm-hmm. And so okay. if, you, if we take the wheat out, you don't have that same creamy mouthfeel. And that's mm-hmm. why we felt all of the grains were so important to put wheat rye or rye right. and wheat in there, right. mm-hmm. you know, rather than just a rye or a wheater. Um, you know, they both kind of add a little bit of complexity, you get a little bit of the creaminess and sweetness from the wheat up front but then that rye kind of little kick right there and then a nice caramel finish yeah now i know a lot of places will source rye whiskey because they just they say that rye is hard to work with do you find that rye is hard to work with yeah it's it's a giant pain to work with um so there's polymers that are are in rye that um you know during fermentation is probably what they normally talk about and what happens is the viscosity is very thick mm-hmm. and it's almost like the easiest way. It's kind of gross to talk about, but it's kind of like snot, you know, when you stick your, <laughs> finger, you stick your finger like this, you're, you're, you you know, it sticks to your fingers and it's just kind of slimy and stringy. Mm. And what happens is, is during fermentation, the yeast is converting the sugar in the grain to alcohol or the starch and, you know, in the form of sugars. And uh, then it's creating CO2. And the problem is that CO2 has no way to evacuate out of the, you know, that thick viscosity. It doesn't float to the top like it should, you yeah. know, in a, in a in a more watery liquid. So the a lot of times it expands in size unless you get a lot of enzymes and, and malt or, or whatever to put in it. And that's why you very rarely see 100% um, rye uh, whiskey. And so, um, but ours, we're able to figure it out. We actually, we used to fill up our tanks halfway full. Because it would actually expand to double the size. Oh wow! And it would settle back down to to where it was. You know, once it got to a certain point during fermentation, uh, the viscosity you know gets more watery, and it it allows all those bubbles to dissipate out, and it shrinks back to where it was. But nice. but that's why rye is so hard. And then it it's um, it's it's really interesting though. But wheat is kind of crazy. When we did our wheat whiskey, mm-hmm. it actually volcanoed. Like you'd look at the tank, and it just looked perfectly calm. And all of a sudden it'd shoot up three or four feet above the tank, you know, and just get this big, vigorous, you know, uh, bubbling, you know, movement. 
and in, inside the tank and then it, it calmed back down again. It was really weird. <laughs> and oat whiskey, oat whiskey was really funny because oats are 60% holes, you know, and this hole is a little protective coating around the grain. Mm-hmm. And so it's almost a, you know, protective shell maybe, but it's not really a shell. But uh, those holes would float to the top of the fermentation tank during the fermentation and it almost looked like a muffin. They just all float to the top and, and just had this big <laughs> nuisance on top of it. You know, I could almost walk across it. Not that I would, but you can almost walk across it. It's, you know, these these holes are on there and they all floated to the top. So wow. it's now, really interesting. I was going to say, the other thing I hear about oats uh, is that they, uh, just the consistency uh, of them, it makes it also very difficult to work with. Yeah, and then oats, oats have this like, waxy characteristic almost like a rubbery waxy where it wants to coat the inside of the stills with like this wax that you can almost just peel off or a a rubber like rubber yeah so it's really fun but what it taught me is is there's kind of a reason why bourbon is is america's drink i mean it's it's so much easier and more consistent i like the way it tastes better you know and and so it's it's kind of funny because it's almost like the easier they are to make yeah the more prevalent they are in the marketplace yeah i guess that's it's uh well i mean and having traveled through tennessee it's really interesting to see what they're doing because they're trying to you know they have defined what tennessee whiskey is and they really have a choice all these new distilleries whether they want to make a tennessee whiskey which would be something that would be specific to their state that no other state could do uh and a lot of people you know think if you ask the common person they'll say well bourbon is just from kentucky and that you can't you nobody else can make it which of course isn't true you can make it make it anywhere but the fun part is now seeing how different areas treat bourbon differently and where you'll go into experimenting or where you may try to use a different variety of a of a grain like for your Mm -hmm. corn what type of what type of corn do you grow there yeah so it's a, a non-gmo um just basically a field corn um it's it we're actually looking for starch in the corn mm-hmm. so everybody thinks like why don't you use sweet corn there's more sugar in sweet corn well we're actually looking for starch and um and so it's very similar to the same kind of corn that we've always grown um although there's lots of different varieties of the you know the same type of field corn and so every year this year, actually, I think we're, we just talked to the, the seed guy we get all of our seed from, and we're going to try 13 different varieties in our test trial. Mm. And they can actually send it out for, you know, starch content, seed size. We actually mill a little bit of it to see if it mills, you know, the, there's different, um, you know, characteristics of the way that it'll mill and, and ferment and everything else. And so we can take these trials and see. And then we also look at yield, um, you know, drought tolerance, you know, and how they grow in our particular soil too. And so last year we planted a variety that was right next to another variety that we knew grew well, and it didn't grow grow very well at all Mm. because it just wasn't the right type of grain or seed for our particular soil and everything else. And so we know not to try that variety ever again, but it's kind of fun to continually evolve and, and, uh, and learn. Have you brought any kinds of grains in uh, other than that, that you have, have tested out and, and that have stuck? Yeah. So another one um, that we tested is a variety of oats that, you know, I was talking earlier how the holes are, are really a nuisance inside the distillery. We found a variety of oats and we had to ship them in from Canada, but they're called naked oats or um, they, they had a fancy name for them, but everybody calls them naked oats because they don't have hole. They're holeless ah. oats. Okay. And so we could try to grow those for the distillery and, and those actually worked really well. Um, and then uh, our, our rye is a Canadian variety of rye. We've always gotten our rye seed even before the distillery from Canada because it's really acclimated to the cold winters. You know, it gets very mm. cold here and in, in Canada they do. And so those varieties do really well in our cold climate and then it gets warm here in the summer. And so um, I did a lot of research um, and uh, tried to figure out what the best variety of rye is. And I actually found out it's the one that we had always grown here. Oh, you wow. Know? It's nice. funny. It's, it's um, you know, the, the same same variety. Um, with wheat, it's it's the same varieties we always grow, but there's different kinds of wheat. There's there's soft 
wheats, there's hard wheats, there's red wheats, there's white wheats, you know, soft red, soft white, you know, whatever. And so we experimented with all kinds of different varieties. And, and a lot of times it has a lot to do with the way that they mill and then the way that they, they actually get broken down when we cook them inside the fermenters. Mm. And so we were able to determine which kind we wanted. And then from there, there's lots of different types of wheat. There's bearded wheats and beardless wheats and all these other things. And so we planted lots of different varieties until we knew in 2013 when we started, you know, commercially, we knew what we wanted. And then every year we plant different varieties of that. Also with like barley, a lot of places can't grow winter barley. Winter crops are ones that we plant in the fall and they grow all winter really slow. And then we harvest them almost the same. We, we, we harvest them pretty close to the same time that we harvest our spring crops that we plant in the spring. But they grow, you know, they have all that time in the winter to grow really slow, to stool out in the ground. What that means is they get a really big, vigorous root system. Yeah. So now it can uptake the nutrients from the soil better, but can also um, uh, withstand droughts and, and lack of water or anything like that. Not that we have droughts because we can irrigate them when they need it, but they just, between irrigations, they're a lot more healthy. And so um, a lot of places in the country, it's really hard to grow for malting barley um, uh, winter varieties of malting barley. Mm. And so we tried it here and because of our, our lack of humidity, um, you know, and our really good soils and, and everything, we found that we're, we're actually able to grow winter malting barley uh, fairly well. And so um, we switched from a spring variety that we used to plant to a winter variety that, that we feel is better quality and it, it's yields better for the fields and it's just an all around better variety. So what were you, this is interesting because I just went to Mount Vernon and mm -hmm. was talking to them about how uh, George Washington's distiller was utilizing the different, he was a farm manager, so same kind of a, a situation. But he, you know, we were talking about rye and I said, well, what do people use rye for? And he said, well, they were using it to, to shift crops basically to keep the the soil good what what do you do with your rye is your before you had a distillery what was what was the purpose of the rye yeah that's a good question so rye is a really good forage crop so like dairies we would take it as silage a lot of the time so they would cut it and they would chop it up into fine pieces they make a giant pile and it actually ferments inside this big dry they call it a drive over pile where you you drive over with big tractors and pack it down yeah and then you feed it to cattle um, or we would, sometimes we would bale it, but it's, it's not as often that we would do that in the like hay bales and things like that. Um, and sometimes people use rye. And I think what they were talking about is, as a cover crop. Right. So they'll plant it in the winter and it'll hold the ground and the, you know, the soil and everything. And then sometimes, and I, and I actually did it this last year, we had some extra rye and instead of taking it to silage or baling it, we actually incorporated it into the soil. And it makes really good organic matter for the soil. And it's, oh. it's like this green manure. Yeah. And then I planted corn after that. And the corn did phenomenal. I mean, it was enormous. After, um, you know, incorporating, we chopped it up first into little tiny pieces and then incorporated it into the soil. And it really, really helps the soil and gives it lots of nutrients. And so there's a lot of things you can do with rye. Nice. That's good to know. I mean, I, I felt like when I was hearing them talk about it, that rye was probably for the longest time just sort of being discarded. And then here comes in a, a farm manager who said, well, we could make whiskey and then we wouldn't have to throw all this rye away. Yeah. So. No, that's what's always fun with the history of everything. Um, for ours, so ours, we call it cereal rye. And that's what rye grain is, you know, the varieties that we grow. And everybody says, what's cereal rye, you know, and, and what's... Um, you know, the difference is there's also rye grass. So there's perennial rye grass, which mm -hmm. is actually just a, a type of grass. And then what we grow is cereal rye. Okay. Cause so it, it relating more to a grain than a grass. A grain than a grass. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. All right. So me being a big fan of scotch, um, it's, it's interesting to think about, um, malting. I miss the fact that we don't get to see malting in most distilleries in the United States. Because if you go, well, it's even disappearing in Scotland. I think there's only four uh, distilleries in Scotland that still do on-site malting. Um, how was your experience, first of all, learning how to uh, malt? And one of the things that they have a problem with there is that the malt, when you're malting, you're constantly having to shovel and flip that 
that barley, and that's where they say the term monkey shoulder comes from, <laughs> is from those guys who would just be turning that barley. Are you doing it the manual way or are you uh, using a, a machine to do it? No, so we have a big drum and it's a big drum that rotates. And so it can turn real slow. And the importance of, of getting it mixed up is to keep the, you know, the moisture really consistent, but also to keep the rootlets. All the little rootlets will grow together and you'll just have one solid mat. Uh, if you let it. And so by rotating the drum real slow, it kind of keeps everything really consistent, the moisture content, the temperatures, everything else really consistent. But it also um, keeps that those rootlets from growing together. So we have a big drum and we have a separate steep tank. And in the steep tank, we get them all of the grain to absorb the moisture. You know, what we're trying to do in the, in the malting process, and, and I'm sure you know, but we're just germinating grain. Grain is a seed, we're germinating the seed. So first we hydrate it, we get it to absorb moisture, and then we put it inside this drum and the drum creates the ideal germinating conditions. So we can add heat, we can cool it, we can humidify it, whatever it takes to create the ideal germinating conditions. And so the, the, the barley will sprout or, or whatever grain we're malting mm -hmm. will sprout. And then once it gets to a certain point, we stop any future growth by drying it. So we dry it down to below 6% moisture and that stops any future growth. And, um, you know, what we've done by malting it is we created enzymes that really help with the um, liquefaction of starch in, in the grains. And so malt is a really important process. And, and like you said, there's very few distilleries in the world anymore that really malt their own barley. But for us, we want to use 100% of our grown grain. So our wheat, rye, barley, and corn that are in all of our whiskeys. And so to do that, we have to malt our own barley. <laughs> I could probably buy malted barley already made for 10% of what it cost me to make it myself. Yeah. You know, that's not who we are. That's not what we want to do. And so um, we have to malt our own barley. But then that kind of opened up the door for allowing us to open, you know, to malt corn and to malt rye and to malt wheat and all these other grains that aren't traditionally malted. Did you ever, because uh, I know you talked about making a scotch-like uh, whiskey. Did you ever toy around with trying to smoke uh, your your while doing the malting process? Yeah, so we did. Um, what we did was is I made a, a our own smoker, and it's, it's kind of unique, um, a little bit different than they do it in Scotland, but it's I put a chimney at the top of a 25-ton a silo, and then I, I had a little fan at the bottom. And I, I smoked our our homemade peat, which I'll tell you about in a second, in um, in the in a little si in a little uh, uh, fireplace in the bottom that goes up the chimney and, and then filters through the grain. Mm. And so what was really fun is is I took, you know, peat is decomposed plant matter over thousands of years, you know, that they dig in these bogs. Well, we don't have any peat here on the ranch or in Nevada, <laughs> and so I made my own peat by uh, decomposing corn stalks. Then taking the powder, there's like a flour that comes off the mill. Yeah. And I mixed it with water and I mixed it with these decomposed corn stalks. Then I pressed it in bread pans and made these blocks of, of our homemade peat Eat. from the ranch here. Nice. And I smoked it with that homemade peat. It was really fun, um, you know, and our barley and everything. So it's kind of our scotch style. <laughs> this, we kind of played around with... Um, you know, smoking some rye and oat, which I think is going to be really interesting and and fun and, and other stuff too. But that's that's kind of the fun stuff that I like to do. Yeah. So that's uh, sitting there aging right now, kind of yep. waiting to find out what that's going to turn out like. Have you, yep. so have, I, you I, have you sampled it a little bit to? Uh... I tasted the other day. I'm really excited about it. It's going to be really good. Oh, that's fun. That's fun. Hey, it and it's sticking with what you're trying to do, which is grain to glass and even making your own peat, which I've never heard of before. So that's that's fantastic. Well, this yeah, is. So that's, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was, yeah, I was I was just going to say that's what's really fun for us as farmers is and uh, you know they we we've never sourced anything like that you know even the grains or the whiskey we didn't want to do that because that's not who we are there's nothing wrong with that i'm not saying any you know anybody that does that's doing anything wrong but that's not who we are and so we wanted to to create a product that's from our farm i i sense that you're still farm first yeah well both i think it's see our our our, our bottle and everything says farmers plus distillers we're kind of we're not one we're not the other we're both right they're both important nice 
Um, so what's your what's your web address when people want to uh, check out more information about you guys? Yeah, so it's just freyranch.com. You can like us on Facebook and Instagram and, and everything. Yeah. Perfect. Excellent. I'll post you guys up on my feed as well. So yeah, and we're open for free tastings and tours every Saturday from noon to four. Okay, and everything's going fine right now through uh, through COVID at this point. Yeah, we're being really safe, so we're at twenty five percent capacity today. Um, you know, as the governor opens and closes things, we might you know we'll, we'll change as, as we need to, but uh, we're really fortunate because um, we we can send people on tours to keep them away from each other and socially distance, and then every once in a while, unfortunately, we have to ask somebody to stay outside for five or ten minutes until a spot opens up inside the tasting room and then we can let somebody in. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're getting used to that though. Yeah. 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 Fantastic. Well, I, I love doing these interviews on site because it gives me a chance to, to see and experience and Lake Tahoe and coming down through that area of the Sierra Nevadas is just absolutely beautiful. So I'm sure I will be back sooner or later. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what you guys are doing and where you're going with it. Yeah, you're welcome anytime. Bring your gloves and your work boots and we'll put you to work for a while. Very good. Nice. I'll have to uh, I'll have to get on something a little less dressy. <laughs> very good. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate you, Colby. Thank you. You have a good day. All right, you too. The whiskey seen in this video was provided by the distiller for the purposes of demonstration. Opinions are 100% my own. Whiskey Lore is a production of Travel Fuels Life, LLC. I'm your host, Drew Hanish. Until next time, cheers and slanjava.